Stanford University. Thanks to Dr. Bernstein for this wonderful invitation to speak with you this evening. And it's really my uh, delight to share the podium with Ann Dubin, a good friend of mine. So um, I will tell you a story, basically, today. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a poem first that's entitled, To an Athlete Dying Young. And this is about the challenge of sudden cardiac death. And, uh, Part of my goal in this talk is really that you will understand why this is such an important area for our field and for, indeed, for our society at large. So I hope you'll share that sense of importance when you leave this uh, session this evening. So this is the um, a poem which was uh, shared with me by one of my colleagues a number of years ago. So I'll take the liberty of reading this to you. To an athlete dying young, the time you won your town the race we chaired you through the marketplace. Man and boy stood cheering by, and home we brought you shoulder high. Today, the road all runners come. Shoulder high, we bring you home and set you at your threshold down, townsman of a stiller town. So I think this is a very poignant uh, poem, and when I first heard this, I think we were, you know, I was very touched by this. Uh, really having dealt with this problem for a number of years. So I'd like to share with you uh, some of this story, uh, acknowledgement to some of my colleagues, uh, et cetera. But I'll have a few goals here. So my first goal is really to share with you my opinion that it indeed is a form of a crisis. Now, we hear about crises all the time, whether it be a financial crisis or another problem. But uh, again, I hope you'll share with me the idea that this is a crisis. We'll talk about some of the causes uh, across a variety of different ages, patient populations, et cetera. I'll share with you what I hope you will regard as the good news, and that is that there are things we can do. And finally, I will share with you potential ways in which we can partner together in conquering in the future. So why the first goal? Well, first of all, if I don't convince you that it's a big problem, you won't listen to what I have to say. So that's a first to goal for any speaker, and particularly if I want you to leave the session today sharing this, um, really, this uh, uh, similar opinion. I was, I was told I heard a lecture at one of these very large sessions at the American Heart Association, our, our compatriot organization. And the speaker said, as he started his talk, he said, you know, a lot of times we give talks and we try to figure out whether we're successful. He said he's come to learn that when he is successful as a speaker, it's not that you've gotten the message to one individual, each of you as individuals, but that you leave the room wanting to share it with others. So I really sincerely hope that you'll leave this room and share what you hear from both of us with other people and get them to join on to our mission uh, together. So that, I hope, we will be able to both accomplish together. So I said I would talk about stories, and so I have quite a story here. So Jack Rogan uh, became a friend, a very dear friend. And the story came about as follows. My daughter was in high school. We opened the local newspaper, which happens to be the San, San Jose Mercury News. And she saw in the section two an article about Mr. Jack Rogan. So Mr. Jack Rogan had been a very vibrant member of the San Jose community. He was a retired uh, executive at IBM for decades, I think three or four decades. Um, and the story was about something that happened to him. So the story unfolds that he is on the tarmac O'Hare Airport, so most of you have been to O'Hare Airport. It's one of our busiest airports in the country. He was waiting to take off. What happened to Mr. Jack Rogan? He had a cardiac arrest. Immediately, and we're very fortunate in the era that we live in, that we have these resources and this knowledge, immediately the well-trained staff on the airplane took an automatic exter external defibrillator, which you'll hear a lot about, and saved his life. 
So he was then taken to a local hospital where he underwent a variety of testing, ultimately bypass graft surgery, recovered, and was subsequently interviewed by this wonderful reporter who was interested in sharing the story with the rest of the world. So my daughter, who is a, was, I think, a sophomore or junior in high school, read this and said, this is a really interesting story. Um, this really touches me and what I'm interested in, and asked how we could contact Mr. Grogan. So they don't have a way that you can contact the patient, the people that are the you know, subject of the study, of uh, the article, but they leave a little email of the person who has the byline. So she emails that person, waits a few days, gets back a response. I would love to put you in touch with Mr. Grogan. So I think you know, maybe a few weeks or a month pass, and uh, they're in touch, and you know, I go with, my wife and I go with her, and we meet Mr. Grogan, Mrs. Grogan, uh, and we you know, have a bite and over coffee. And uh, he tells her story once again. Uh, he tells to her his story. And so in that way, that first meeting, our families became joined. And he became, I must say, one of the most influential people I've ever met in my entire life because of the way in which then he took upon himself being a survivor, coming back with this incredible positive attitude that says, I've been given another chance. I want to do something important with that second chance in the, for the rest of my life. And in saying that and being willing to say that, he transformed each one of us and I think everybody he touched. So he ended up becoming uh, a spokesperson, was responsible for uh, the bill that passed the California legislature, which now requires automatic external defibrillators in every fitness club in California. He's res personally responsible for that. He became the San Jose Fire Department uh, liaison and program director for automatic external defibrillators. Not because I think he, they, get, they paid him anything, but because this was his passion. And I'll get to the later part of the story. So he became really a dear friend of ours. So when I got a call not too long ago that he, had, he was coming back from an organization that he helped found called the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Association of America. He just attended their national board of trustees meeting, had flown back with his son, was in San Jose airport, and had another cardiac arrest. His son was there, the staff were very prompt, they could not resuscitate him. He died. I went to his funeral in his wake, and there were lined up people from the San Jose Fire Department uh, uh, to give uh, remembrance of him. And again, he was one of the people who has influenced me more than anyone, and it really led me to believe that we have a mission that we should share that and be free in sharing that and with other people. So I hope you'll share that. But the story is more complicated for me. So this is a picture of myself, uh, circa medical residency at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center with my father. So not long after this picture was taken, I received that dreaded phone call. It was my mother unfortunately saying, you know, something's happened to your dad. And a, family, a close family member was with her at the time, and the news was he had died suddenly. That's uh, over 20, you know, 30 years ago, but obviously transformed my opinion about some of what my life work had to become. So I'd like to share with the, you these two stories because I think it brings a, a form of reality a familiarity so that you will feel that we can talk to each other, although we've never met each other, about this very personal yet societal problem. So why do I say it's a public health crisis? So I cannot say it with statistics like this, you know, that says that a thousand people die every day, that will die tomorrow, that died yesterday, and the day after tomorrow. No, I will quote my friend Jack Rogan, who, needless to say, gave 
hundreds, if not thousands of talks to every person who would listen to him about this problem of sudden cardiac arrest. And what he said, he opened every talk by saying, two 747 jets crashed today. And clearly, literally, he did not mean that. But he said, a 1,000 people just died today of sudden cardiac arrest. What does that mean in terms of the number of people who have been touched across our communities and our society? What does that mean? Why isn't that on the front page? We all know that if two 747s crash, it would be on the front page of every you know, a newspaper on every television show across America. But this is what happens every single day. And when I give these talks similarly, I get the same reaction he does. They can't believe it. They say, you must have your statistics wrong. It, it's not possible that I've not, as a well-read person, I've heard all about disease and health. Uh, how come I haven't heard this message? How could it be possibly something that's never been shared to me? That's exactly the case. So that's, again, why I would say we have a crisis of sorts. OK. What are the leading causes? So we'll talk about a variety of causes that span ages of life. And luckily, I have my dear colleague, Dr. Dubin, who will share further insights, particularly as it re reflects uh, the pediatric population. So in this pie chart, which is one of many studies uh, related, in fact, to the article that I believe that was shared with you, uh, to look at the variety of causes that particularly occur in people that are young. We generally and generously, perhaps, say that's 40 or younger. But you might want to add it to be 60 or 70, and that's OK with me. So there are a variety of different conditions, and we'll touch upon them in a moment to look at what these conditions are. The most common in North America is a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hyper means more, trophic means grow. Uh, so it's a thickening or growing of the heart tissue, so thickening of the heart muscle, which is the most common cause of sudden death in young people in the United States. So again, you would wonder, well, have I heard of that before? Is that something that's been shared with me? And in fact, one in 500 individuals have that. Now, luckily, the vast majority of them will never die suddenly uh, and will go on to live uh, very uh, full and rich lives. Frequently, however, it is, or most commonly, I should say, it is not manifest until later in their teens, uh, mid to teens, uh, to late teens, and so you will not necessarily, or you will not likely see this uh, when the child is born. These are genetic abnormalities that involve proteins that are involved in contractility and squeezing that you've heard about from Dr. Bernstein uh, in, these, uh, in their function. This is a um, uh, well-known graph uh, that indicates over ages uh, that there is risk that goes on, that patients can, in fact, have stroke, heart failure, and sudden cardiac death throughout many decades of life. And this can continue on as a uh, continuing risk. What are some of the other conditions that we consider? So there is a congenital abnormality. Again, we all find it a curiosity that you can be born with something and yet be many decades later, later where it becomes a clinical problem. Uh, and this is the situation very commonly with what's called anomalous coronary arteries. You all know the heart needs to get blood flow. That's one of the major uh, parts of the, heart, the heart circulation and the body circulation is to actually give the, the heart itself blood. And sometimes these are congenitally placed in an unusual location. And that unusual location can predispose one to sudden death. This happens to be a picture of Pete Maravich, a um, standout uh, athlete who finished his entire professional career only to die suddenly of anomalous coronary arteries after he finished his professional career. Half have some symptoms, typically with exertion, before this, uh, these symptoms occur. Another condition called long QT, long QT syndrome is a genetic disorder. It actually relates to little molecules that function in terms of letting little ions go back and forth within the heart cells and affect the electrical system of the heart and cause it to go uh, awry. 
And those are the ones that, are in fact, cause these heart rhythm problems that can be precipitated by many things, including stress, emotion, exertion, and things like that. Coronary artery disease, and here is the transition. This is Jim Fix. He was a world-class runner, as you know, and uh, he died suddenly of three-vessel coronary artery disease. Uh, this is Sergei Grinkov, Olympic gold medals, medalist figure skater. They both died suddenly. So what can we say about coronary artery disease? <clears throat> as I've mentioned, it is one of the causes in people younger than 40, but is the most common cause over the age of 40, coronary artery disease. <clears throat> Hank Gathers, Reggie Lewis. The understood or proposed mechanism of death was sudden cardiac death due to myocarditis, uh, a presumed inflammatory, potentially infectious process that affected the heart muscle itself and caused scarring and led to sudden cardiac death. What about our, the ways in which we approach uh, people in the United States? What are the mechanisms agreed upon by virtually every society that we have? American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, American Academy of Sports Medicine, uh, Pediatrics, uh, Academy of Pediatrics. What is the best or the current um, screening technique? So of these choices, it currently consists of a history and a physical examination. While very good, and indeed thorough history and physical examination can pick up many of these conditions, they cannot pick up all of them. And so that is an area of great interest and great investigation at this time. Another condition that I am sure you have heard of, but has really remained a mystery throughout the decades, is highlighted in this little news clipping that again was shared by one of my colleagues. And so I'll read you part of this. <clears throat> so this is a, a very happy story in, in the end because this is Sean Morley after this event occurred. So Sean Morley um, was a uh, baseball player, and it says, the pitcher hurled a fastball chest high, but way inside. It hit the 13-year-old in the chest. The thud could be heard in the dugout. So what happened next? The young ball player went into cardiac arrest and something that experts would have only said under the precise conditions. And he was resuscitated by a standby, a bystander who used an automatic external defibrillator. And therefore, he is here with us as a survivor um, and uh, has gone on to also meet you know, lay audiences um, and has been a spokesperson for this condition. How does this occur? We think it's because of a precisely timed impact to the chest that translate mechanical energy into electrical energy that affects the heart in just the precise way, causing this kind of a heart rhythm problem. That's shown in this um, uh, experimental model uh, where the impact is shown and the, the um, uh, ensuing rhythm is ventricular fibrillation, you know, a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia resulting uniformly in sudden cardiac arrest and death, unless resuscitated. So goal three. So we've already gone through relatively quickly, you know, two of the three, the you know, four goals of the talk. So what can we do now? What can we do together? What is available? So always the answer to, I think, almost every medical problem is either to prevent the condition so if it is preventable, that's always the best solution. If we can get to the underlying cause, that's also the best solution. However, there remains this problem where the main focus needs to be, and I will outline some of the reasons why, is that we need to get to the patient rapidly and resuscitate the patient from cardiac arrest. Currently, in this regard, there are really only two practical methods, in my opinion. One is our emerging medical services and automatic external defibrillators. They're with us in our communities, in our daily lives. They're our best chance for survival. 
That's number one. Second, there are a group, there is a group of high-risk patients who, who are best served by having a special pacemaker-like device called an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD. Those are really, in my opinion, really only of the two ways that we can address this aspect effectively. Survival drops after cardiac arrest by what percentage each minute? 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, Every minute goes down by approximately 10%. It's not strictly linear, though in this graph we've shown it to be that way, but you can see that in the average response time of five to 10 minutes, your likelihood of survival is extremely low. And indeed, nationally, it remains less than 10% survival. There are very few conditions that one can say that their survival is less than 10% across our society and that death occurs in several minutes time. And this is one of those conditions. So as you'll hear more about, uh, indeed by uh, my colleague as well, there is what I regard as really one of the really enabling technologies that has surfaced in our uh, communities and in our lives. And that's called the Automatic External Defibrillator, or AED. Why is it so special? Defibrillators have been around now for a number of decades, but the advance here is that they're made for the layperson. This device talks to you. It will talk you through uh, resuscitating a patient with cardiac arrest. And in fact, studies have shown more people in O'Hare Airport are resuscitated successfully by passerbys than by the staff of the airport itself. So a major th you know, a statement that says, this is really made for the general public to use uh, to, to great benefit. It automatically recognizes the rhythm gives you simple instructions of what to do, and indeed is extremely successful. Where is the highest likelihood of survival of cardiac arrest? In a hospital, in an airport, in an airplane, in a casino, in a sports arena. Where is the highest likelihood of surviving a cardiac arrest? So it, you would think, well, maybe an airport. I, I see those signs. Now, how do you tell where an AED is? There's a lightning bolt sign. That's the uniform agreed upon sign that if you see a lightning bolt, there's going to be an AED there. I've mentioned all airports, all airlines, domestic, international have to have these. State by state, it depends whether fitness clubs have them and other you know, municipal facilities. So the answer turns out, in a very miraculous way, in my opinion, <laughs> that is a casino in which their survival is the highest. There are now a number of well-done studies that have actually published that their survival can be up to 60 to 70 percent. Now, I really would ask, what condition can you take that the survival is less than 10 percent, you could walk into a casino, and your likelihood <laughs> multiplies are surviving by more than sixfold. What condition is that? I don't know of any other condition for which that statement is true, but we believe it to, to be true for sudden cardiac arrest. So though that is a humorous and really an enjoyable thing to tell about, it's really that for a reason that I describe that. So how is it possible that you can improve survival so much by this kind of factor of you know, happenstance of where you are? It's all about time. We mentioned that you, the survival drops 10% per minute. Well, there are some very noteworthy aspects or characteristics of casinos that we all take for granted. And that is that people are watching other people all the time. And so they go and they see, and they're, I'm sure they're not watching for this, but they look for other things in a casino, things that are happening. But that when a patient drops, they say, they get on the little walkie-talkie and they say, we've got another one, Joe. And they run over and they resuscitate him so they can go and gamble some more. So it's a very happy story, and this is why it's so successful. So it tells us 
And this is one of the principles that I will want you to take home, is that though there are many things we have to do in science together as colleagues, some of the solution is right in front of us. We know that this is an electrical problem of the heart, though no matter how simple-minded it sounds, electricity is the solution. This is how people are resuscitated, by using an electrical treatment that is you know, nearly 100% successful if applied in this way. So we've learned something important about the nature of this condition by studying it in this fact. The further study, uh, further part of the story, I think many of you may have watched Tim Russert on TV. You know, I think he was a, you know, a very um, well-known um, uh, part of Meet the Press, a very important part of the, the um, news media nationally. And he died suddenly at the age of 58 in the studio. As far as we could tell, there was an AED. They did not know to use it. So, I, you know, one could speculate, had they used an AED, would he be here today and continuing his very vibrant career in news? But so now I hear more stories that are brought to me where that is the theme. There Was there an AED, I ask? They said yes, but someone didn't know they were supposed to use it. Uh, they didn't know where it was. Uh, they didn't know they were supposed to get it in these circumstances, et cetera. So that has become not necessarily the biggest concern that we don't have them. Yes, we need them to have them more prevalent, and I will emphasize that later in my talk, but we need to be aware of them. What I say is that you know, many of you, have, you know, raise kids, et cetera, you may have had a fire drill in your home. What happens if there's going to be a fire in your home? We're going to go out that entrance. One should have the same kind of prepared response. If there is an emergency of this kind, we'll know what to do if it happens. OK. So Mr. Cheney has an ICD, so said the headline of this article, should you. So indeed, we'll talk a little bit about that. So these special devices are designed to recognize, within seconds, the occurrence of a life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation, and therefore give the, uh, uh, the electrical shock immediately. So I mentioned we can get the survival up to 60, 70, 60 to 70 percent if you're in a casino. Uh, the survival from a shock, uh, an episode like this, is 99 plus percent, because it can act so quickly. So in this spectrum of conditions, we talk about less serious rhythm problems to what clearly we're talking about are the most serious rhythm problems. There are now very fine studies that show very pretty graphs and multicolors like this that show that therapies such as defibrillators can improve survival in the correct patient population. So as I've already uh, iterated, the argument is we do know in some regards how to save lives. We don't need to invent necessarily a new therapy because we have some of those. And we, in fact, as I believe, these are the our only chances today of really making an impact. So very briefly, we'll talk about the future. The future always begins with better understanding. There's very few things in medicine, very few major breakthroughs that don't come back to having a better understanding of the initiating factors in the environment. And so this is where the cross-disciplinary uh, work between what we call fondly, I think hopefully fondly, bench scientists and clinicians, uh, without that collaboration, these advances are not possible. But in my opinion, this is how we will make these great breakthroughs is from this understanding of these complex uh, parts of our body. And I know you'll take from this course that every day we learn more what we don't know, and it's not the opposite way around. This is indeed the challenge why I've really said that, yes, uh, we need a population-based approach that this pyramid represents the patients um, uh, who exist and the percentage 
of them or the number of them who represent the total number of people who die suddenly. The majority are not in populations that we can easily identify. They're part of people in our communities. And so that is the biggest challenge. How do you identify risk of a life-threatening condition that could strike within minutes and you have to have the correct response within minutes for a person to survive? That's why it's such a big, difficult problem. So what do I think can be done? I think we can have AEDs that are much more part of our lives. That this whole conversation, I hope, will be spread throughout your communities, and indeed that I'll be successful not only in getting the message to you, but you will get that, though, that message to others. Can we detect a heart attack in its early stages? Can we detect heart rhythm problems early and better predict these patients who are likely to have sudden cardiac arrest? We have to have a greater sense of awareness of the survivors, celebrate the lives as I've started as we celebrated Jack Rogan's uh, life. And really, by doing that, there'll be more of an acceptance of these approaches. It'll be part of our way of life. It'll be a real problem, uh, part of what we do. For the job of us in healthcare, the job is that we need to identify patients who would be best served with these special devices and, of course, improve cardiac, cardiovascular health. Smoking cessation, weight loss, manage of hypertension, um, exercise, et cetera. What can you do? Support EMS in your community. Budget cuts affect every community. Having an ambulance, you know, a few more here or there, sometimes looks like it's not an issue. This is the only way we're going to be able to resuscitate people in our communities by keeping our EMS services strong. Become involved in ways to distribute AEDs. So again, when the discussion comes up, do we need just one AED, or can, do we really would we benefit from having one in the front part of the building and one in the back part of the building as well? Involved in a sudden uh, cardiac death awareness campaign, and I mentioned there is a public, you know, it's a nonprofit organization called the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Association of America, and they are the leading organization in this area, in addition to American Heart Association and our Heart Rhythm Society. Celebrate our life, support research in sudden cardiac death and um, uh, these, these advances in resuscitation. So I will uh, end in that way. Uh, as we mentioned, we'll be delighted to take your questions uh, as I pass off to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Um, so Paul did a really beautiful job about talking about the problem of sudden cardiac death in our communities, just looking at it from the, the big picture. From And quite honestly, sudden cardiac death really affects adults way more than it affects children, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, but what I kind of want to get on a soapbox about and talk a little bit more about is the fact that, yes, indeed, sudden cardiac death does affect children, A, and B, what, when we think about this, we're going to have to go to greater lengths in order to take care of these children because of issues that we're going to come up with in a little bit. So as a pediatric electrophysiologist, I find myself many days looking at devices and technology and uh, procedures that were really kind of put in place for people like the gentleman on your right hand side. Um, it to be used, and, and instead I'm having to use them in people who look like this on the left-hand side, which I kind of like to do. And, and when you do that, oops, you find out that you end up with things like this happening, okay? And this is a real patient who ended up having a very small child, about a, I think this child was about three years old, who ended up having to have a defibrillator put in back at the time when that we couldn't have defibrillators for smaller children. We, they were big, big, bulky things. These were made for adults, and we had to kind of squeeze it into a child. And you can see this is really just wires everywhere, two devices that are in place, taking up the entire abdomen. Here's the heart. You can barely see the heart underneath all the wires. Um, and so this you can just, nobody needs to, to look at this and say, oh, yeah, this is going to be fine. There's, there are going to be issues. And we're going to get into the issues that we see with this. Um, so the problems that we face in pediatric electrophysiology are really extra challenges that we get because we have small patients. It's pretty easy. I mean, I'm not dealing with an average adult. I'm dealing with the little infant. Um, they have very small thoracic and abdominal cavities. They have small blood vessels. 
they have small hearts, they're going to grow. Um, you're going to get somebody who's about you know, 19 inches tall who are, is suddenly going to end up being at least five, six feet tall in the end. I have to kind of look into the future and figure out how am I going to deal with that. Um, they're going to live longer, hopefully, than a 70-year-old who's going to get an ICD. If I put an ICD into a 10-year-old, my hope is they're going to live 70, 80 years, uh, as opposed to the 70-year-old who I hope is going to live another 20, 30 years, but it's a little bit different. Um, and on top of that, the majority of the patients who I see, as I think Dr. Bernstein talked to you a little bit about last week, have major issues with the way their heart is formed. They don't have normally formed heart. They have congenital abnormalities. And because of that, that makes life a little bit more difficult when I have to think about different devices and different procedures in order to try and fix heart problems, heart rhythm problems. So we're going to talk about a problem that um, Dr. Wong didn't talk about initially. Um, this was a patient who we just had, we saw about three days ago. She was a 10-year-old girl who came in with complaints of her heart beeping. And in pediatric EP, you get the most imaginative descriptions <laughs> of people who are having heart flutters or palpitations. My heart beeps. There are butterflies in my stomach. Um, you know, my, my brain just felt like it was shuddering. And, I mean, I get all sorts of interesting uh, comments on what they feel. But her heart beeped. Um, and it happened especially when she was exercising. And uh, the other thing that happened with her is she said, you know, I got really, really dizzy when this happened. And there was one time I kind of found myself on the floor. And her mom wasn't in the room. And the mom came in the room. And she found her on the floor. She was awake by that point. But it got us a little bit nervous about her. So as part of her wor normal workup, we got an electrocardiogram, which is a recording of the electrical activity of the heart that we can do from the surface. And what we found was this electrocardiogram over here. So this is a normal electrocardiogram, OK? There is electrical activity that reflects the upper part of the heart squeezing the atrium. This is a P wave. There's then a little bit of a pause. And then there's a very sharp, narrow QRS complex, which represents the bottom part of the heart beating. OK? And you can see there's just kind of nice and sharp. Her EKG looked kind of different. If you look, you can hardly see her P wave, which is that atrial part of the heart beating. And then there's this kind of big slurry thing. It goes right into the ventricular part. Okay? And this is a problem that is called WPW syndrome. And that stands for Wolf-Parkinson-White. It's been around for a little, we've known about this problem for a very long period of time since the early 1900s. And what it is is an additional electrical pathway in the heart, which allows the electrical impulse to directly stimulate the ventricle. So normally, as Dr. Bernstein talked about last week, there's the sinus node starts the electrical impulse. It goes through the atrial tissue, the upper chamber, to the, through the AV node, down the normal conduction to the ventricle. And as it goes through there, as the electrical impulse goes through, it causes the heart to contract. In people who have WPW, they have an extra roadway in their heart so that the electricity can not only go down this one-way street, it can go down this avenue as well. And when it does that, it gives you that special look on the EKG. When you have this abnormality, you are prone towards one of two arrhythmias, hopefully only one, but you can have a two. So one problem that you can have is that when the timing is just right and things, the situation is just perfect, you can have the impulse go down the normal conduction system, make a U-turn, come back up, and start a rotary or a short circuit and go round and round and round and your heart go fast. And that's called SVT, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. The other problem that in a very small percentage of people that can happen is that as you get older, you can have other heart rhythm problems. Or if you have a lot of SVT, which is that round and round rhythm problem, you can have these random explosions in your heart called, in the upper part of your heart called atrial fibrillation. And this is a very common arrhythmia in adults. We hear about it all the time. Not so common in children except in this condition where they get these random explosions in the upper part of the heart, and the upper part of the heart kind of shakes like jelly. It goes 300, 400 times a minute. Now, in people like you and I, if we have that happen, the, bot the middle part of our heart, the AV node says, whoa, I'm not going to go that fast. Forget it. It's not going to happen. And it protects us so that while even though the upper part may be going 300, 400 times a minute, the bottom part only goes about 60, 70, 80, whatever. Okay? It's, it's smart enough to say, I can't go that fast. People who have accessory pathways, in a very small number of these people, the accessory pathway is dumb, okay? And it doesn't protect your heart. 
And so what it does is it allows these electrical impulses to be conducted directly down to the ventricle and kind of bombarding the ventricle really, really fast. And when that happens, kind of like sticking your finger in a socket, and the bottom part of the heart starts shaking, and that's potentially life-threatening. That causes that ventricular fibrillation that Dr. Wong showed. So while in the majority of people this isn't a really big deal and isn't potentially a, a, a life-threatening arrhythmia, in a small percentage it is, and especially when we hear about children who faint, we get really concerned about it. And so that's why she came to such attention. And here is that SVT rhythm, the round and round rhythm as we talked about. It can go down the normal conduction system and back up and around and cause this relatively rapid very narrow rhythm, heart rates of about 200 to, to 240 beats per minute. That's what she felt when she felt her heart beeping. So we talked about the options with her and her parents and said, well, you know, there are different ways that we can take care of it. And what they opted for was ablation therapy. And what ab ablation therapy is, it's a, a procedure that we're going to go into in a few minutes where you can actually destroy this abnormal tissue. And interestingly enough, this is really now becoming a disease of the young. Um, the adult electrophysiologists, my adult electrophysiology colleagues, don't get to see a whole lot of this anymore because we kind of scarf it all up when children are young. And adults nowadays, you know, once they have their abl pathways ablated, they will go on to develop other rhythm problems. We probably, they're over at, <laughs> so, so it's getting to be more of a pediatric problem than an adult problem. We tend to have over 1,000 patients per year in our national registry with this problem. And it's now become so commonplace that we do this in patients who are with anywhere between the ages of three and five and over. So we can do this at very, very young ages if we need to. We can do it in the smallest of patients in situations where it's potentially life-threatening. We can do it in patients who are even less than one and a half, have done it in patients who are even two to three months of age. And the issue is, however, is that the, that the technology that we're using to study these small patients is technology that has been developed for the adults. And so we're trying to take this technology that's made for big blood vessels and big people and use it in these very, very small hearts. So what we do is we take these long catheters and we put them through big IVs that are placed in the leg and in the neck and we place these big long wires, and I'm gonna show you a picture of those in a minute, through the blood vessels into the different parts of the heart to record the electrical activity. When we're able to do that, we can then figure out exactly where our problem is and, and get rid of it. And we do this initially using x-rays to help us get there. And here's our, here are our, our catheters. These are long wires that have little electrodes on the end that allows us to figure out exactly where these electrical issues are. Now, the problem is when we do these procedures, we have to use x-rays. And we have to expose people to fluoroscopy, which is a type of x-rays. And the, when we're, these cases tend to be relatively long. They can be three, four hours long when we're trying to figure out exactly where these pathways are and get rid of them. And it used to be that the average fluoro time for these patients was about 30 minutes, with over 20% of patients requiring more than 50 minutes of fluoro time. So the, the, the issue is here is that, as everyone here knows, being exposed to x-rays increases your risk of many cancers. Children are much more sensitive to x-rays than adults, and they have a longer lifespan during which these cancers can end up developing. So what we have started to do is we have now started using a system, it's kind of like a GPS system, that was initially developed for adult procedures um, to try and minimize the amount of x-rays we use. And so this is an example of this system. And what this system does is it uses the impedance measured from the surface of the heart based on, from the, the surface, excuse me, of the body, using a special catheter and measuring the impedance there to actually locate that catheter within the body itself. And it, it, it's really a GPS system itself. And it allows us to see exactly where our catheters are without using any x-rays at all and shows us exactly where we need to go and where we want to be and therefore hopefully decreasing the risk of these cancers in children in the future. And so what we've been able to show, and my, my, my colleague, Dr. Miyake, showed this uh, very nicely in a paper that she just uh, presented last year, is that when a center started using this technology, they could actually decrease the amount of x-rays that these children were exposed to by over 50%. Big, big difference. So we're looking into the future for these kids. We're not only just dealing, okay, we have to think about the next five years, we have to think about the next 60 years for them. Um, the ablation itself 
is performed using either radio frequency energy waves or cryoenergy. And Dr. Wong is really one of the founders. He's kind of one of the fathers of cryoenergy. So I have to put the, bring this in here for there. And so we, we either burn away the problem or we freeze away the problem. And you can see, nice from Christmas story. Um, and the energy really that we use is kind of chosen based on the location of the pathway. We know that when we use the burning technique, um, it, we have a high risk of causing heart block or causing a disruption of the normal system if we have to burn near where the normal system lives. Some of these pathways, I made my picture show the pathway far away from the normal system, but sometimes it's really close. And if we burn in that area, we can end up causing the normal system to have a disconnect and people needing pacemakers. So therefore, we now have opted to use this cryoablation or the freezing technique, which actually has a much lower risk of heart block. Again, another technology that was, a, that was formed in the adult world that we now have kind of adapted to try and make things safer for children. The problem here is these catheters are really big. And so we would love to have smaller catheters to use, but we can't. And I'm going to get into why we can't in a while. <laughs> And here's a nice example. This is that child who you can see. Remember, we, we talked about how this is her EKG. Remember how we talked about how she had that slurring? She had the short PR interval, the, short, the P wave, and then right away the QRS, and it was slurred. And so here we are. We put on our energy here, and we have one beat, two beat, the third beat. All of a sudden, it looks like a normal EKG because we burned away that spot. And so now her risk of sudden death is gone. Her risk of having an abnormal heart rhythm is gone. She needs no medicines for the rest of her life, and she's cured. Oops. OK. So Dr. Wong really went into all of this about the issues of the athlete who is at risk of sudden death. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about that, but we're going to kind of switch gears now and go from ablation to another problem that we also see. This was a 13-year-old boy who came in actually last week. Um, he was in good health, and he had no medical problems, had done well his whole life, no problems at all, hanging out. And at school during gym class, he suddenly had a cardiac arrest. Um, and we've now had three of these in the last three weeks. So this is something that does happen. Uh, his gym teacher started CPR, the school's AED was located, and the patient was shocked back into his normal rhythm. EMT arrived, and they intubated him, and resuscitated him, and they brought him on into the intensive care unit. When we were here, when we went, got him in our hospital, what we did was we performed an echocardiogram and an ECG. And our electrocardiogram, the, the, looking at the electrical system, the heart, we found that his heart had a very large left ventricle. And we did an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound test of the heart, to look at the heart structure. And what we found in, is that he had a really, really thick left ventricle. This is his whole left ventricle cavity. This, it's very, very small. I mean, you can see this is all muscle. It's a lot of muscle that's sitting in his heart. Um, and so he had the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as Dr. Wong had mentioned, at which point we decided that he also needed to have a defibrillator placed. As we've mentioned before, defibrillator therapy is life-saving. It can protect people who have died. It can protect people who are going to die. Usually, these devices are placed through the blood vessel into the heart with the battery pack sitting usually under the skin over in the left chest region. Um, and they, it just sits there waiting and seeing. It can then sense if you have a bad heart rhythm, an abnormal heart rhythm, such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. It gives a heart a shock, usually within about 20 to 30 seconds, and can resuscitate the patient. It's kind of like an insurance policy. So what are the warning signs? I mean, how do, how, I mean this kid was doing just fine. And there was nothing there that gave us any thoughts. Well, unfortunately, there really is a lot of variability in warning signs. Some kids will be just like this one, never have a problem, never have an issue, and then suddenly drop. Um, interestingly, 80% of young people who do have an unexpected sudden car death, we can find a cause, which is quite interesting. There, usually, there is something. There are some patients who are really at high risk, patients who faint during exercise. That's a big warning sign to us. That gets us very interested in a patient and says, OK, you need to come see us, and we need to investigate why that is. So people who have syncope or who faint when they exercise are people that we really need to, to be involved with. People have a really strong family history of people dying suddenly. Uh, again, this is one of those causes of these familial 
problems that Dr. Wong mentioned, such as long QT syndrome or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because Dr. Wong spent a good bit on it. Um, while there, this is about 100 in children and adolescents in high school, there's about sudden death is about 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 100,000. Excuse me, I left a zero off there. Um, there are 5 million athletes at the high school level, so we're talking about 100 sudden deaths per year in, in young people. Okay, It's not as big a problem as in the adults, but it is real, and it's really devastating when you lose a 13, 14, 15-year-old. It really affects the community, understandably. Uh, it accounts for about 2 to 20 percent of all deaths we see in children, um, and it's about 1.5 to 1.8 per 100,000 patient years. So what are the issues when we try and put these ICDs in children? What are the things that we face as pediatric um, electrophysiologists? And probably some of the biggest problems are that hopefully these patients are going to stick around for a long time and that they're going to grow. They're not going to be static. You're not going to put an ICD into a 10-year-old and he's going to stay 10-year-old size for the rest of his life. Hopefully he's going to grow up, become a nice strapping 6'6", um, and you know be very active. So the problem that we see when we do this is that these leads can't grow with the patient, okay? They're static, they can't change. So what we end up having, and it's kind of, I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see here, a little bit easier here. So this is a device, as you would have expected, that's placed within the heart, as we talked about before. And before you're in the other picture, if you remember seeing, the device ended way over here, over in the ventricle. If you look at this device, it ends here, okay? So what's happened is the patient has grown and the device is stretched. And as it keeps stretching, can't go anywhere, just keep stretching, eventually it's going to break. Okay? And that's our biggest problem, is that these leads break. And they break especially as patients grow. Um, the other issue we have is that here's another nice example of a lead break. Patient grew, lead can't change, you're going to get a break. The other thing that happens is that we tend to have higher heart rates in children than we do in adults. And so we have to keep their heart rates a little bit higher sometimes. This then causes us to use up our batteries much more quickly. And whereas in adults, batteries can last seven to 10 years. In children, they can last as little as one to two years in very small children. So we have to be careful about that. These leads, while they're really durable, aren't really meant to withstand children. And so they, we do end up getting lead stretches and lead breaks pretty consistently. And that's because children do different things than adults and have very different interests in adults. I would say that the majority of my patients are really kind of interested in these kind of things, and probably most often this <laughs> or this. They all want to do this, as opposed to these kind of things, OK? And so they're going to really put these devices through the ringer. And unfortunately, these devices aren't made for that. The other issue is when we put these big leads into small blood vessels, there's no place for the blood to go. And so what happens is we end up obstructing or losing the flow in these big blood vessels. Um, and here's an example of a patient who they have a lead that's going through a blood vessel and we've placed dye through that blood vessel and you can see instead of being a nice normal line here, there are all sorts of little squigglies, which are all these extra little blood vessels that have come in because that blood vessel doesn't work anymore and there's no blood flow going normally. This is a problem because we then can't use that blood vessel ever again. And so if his lead breaks and it comes out, we're stuck. We don't have another blood vessel to use. The other issue is sometimes we can't get to the places we want to get to in the heart. Sometimes their hearts are made abnormally so that we can't actually place it within the heart. We have to place it on the outside of the heart. Here's an example of an ICD. Instead of going through the blood vessels into the ventricle, it's sitting on the outside of the heart around, on the, outs around the, the chest wall uh, to give the heart a shock. Um, as this patient grew, instead of going all the way around, it slipped forward, and now it won't work any longer. The other issue with these kind of non-conventional systems, which we put in very small children or children with congenital heart disease, are that they don't last as long as the adults, as the normal system. So here's a normal transvenous system and how long it lasts. If when we have to place it, these kind of systems that we are non-conventional or that we have to try and kind of uh, put together, MacGyver almost, I would call it, these, these systems don't last as long as, as the normal systems do at all. 
Finally, the other big problem that we have that's a little bit bigger than the adults is while these, these ICDs are wonderful and that they can recognize abnormal heart rhythms and shock you out of them immediately and save your life, there's a downside to ICDs as well that, that all patients who have them need to understand. And the problem here is that sometimes that the, the machine is only as, as good as the information it gets. And sometimes these machines get ab information that says somebody's in an abnormal heart rhythm when they're not. And in that case, it will shock the heart inappropriately. And this is a nice example of this. So this is another one of our patients who had an ICD put in because he also had, had a sudden death episode. Um, and he was doing fine, came, got out of the hospital, was doing well, and that summer he went to a uh, amusement park. <laughs> I won't tell you which amusement park this is, but um, let me tell you that it's still there, and, and that this, this is still there. And in this amusement park, they had this machine on the very quaint looking Victorian Main Street. And on Main Street, the electricity is life machine. And I, I'm sure everybody has seen these guys, where you hold on to either end. Uh, here are the two, two areas that you hold on to, these two metal prongs that you hold on to, and you hold on as long as you can. And the longer you hold on, the more current that goes through you to complete the circuit. Right? And everybody does get a little buzz, and everybody sees how long they can hold on before they get too much of an electric shock. And so he did this. Put nothing on it, tell him he shouldn't do it. You know, and we give him all sorts of warnings, and there's nothing there. And here's his EKG from his, from his device when he does this. And you can see it kind of is going, going along normally, bump, bump, bump. And suddenly, see all this stuff here? All that extra little stuff in the meantime? All this little bit stuff here? All this kind of noise? It comes in and you see how it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the electrical current going through him, <laughs> okay, and causing him to do this. And all of a sudden, the device says, oh my goodness, he's not in a normal heart rhythm at all. This is, this is an abnormal heart rhythm. This is a very fast abnormal heart rhythm. We have to do something. And so it gives his heart a shock. So he was in a nice normal rhythm, but the device didn't think he was in a normal rhythm, and so gave him an inappropriate shock. And there was absolutely no warning on this thing that this happened. So these are the situations we find ourselves in where we're going to, OK, now you can't actually go and hold on to that either. <laughs> um, and this is a big problem in children, because we run into these kind of issues. Children have higher heart rates normally than adults do. They have more lead breaks, which will also give you noise. And so inappropriate discharges in children are anywhere between you know, 25 and 50% of time you'll see inappropriate discharges as opposed to about 17% of adults having them. It's a big deal. OK. So oh, we still have time. OK. So Dr. Wong also spoke to you a lot about AEDs. And AEDs are wonderful things, but I'm going to kind of bring up another problem with them. So they are now widely available in many places, in airports, in health clubs, in schools, in casinos, um, everywhere. And the assumption here is, as he said, that sudden cardiac death is caused by VF, and that the time to defibrillation is critical, and that lay people really should be empowered to use AEDs. And, he's, and it's absolutely right. They've saved a ton of lives. They saved our 13-year-old that we just talked about. Really important, and here's a nice example of them, and they're really straightforward. Anybody can use them. They t it'll talk you through it if you, if you have one. And no one should ever feel af afraid to, to, if you see somebody, never feel afraid. Just grab it, put it down. It's going to talk you through it, and you'll save somebody's life. It's amazing. Um, this was initially, so the AHA introduced a public health initiative, the American Heart Association, back in 2004. And what they said was that um, there needs to be, a, for, because this became very important as far as schools. This became a big, big issue as far as what do we do in schools with this, and should schools, all schools have AEDs, and do all schools need them? And there's a big controversy that we're going to get into in a minute. And so what they came out was that, that schools really need a medical emergency response plan. And the, probably the most important thing is effective and efficient communication throughout the school. They need to practice their response, OK? And this is where we're going to run into trouble. They need to be able to say, OK, this is where our AED is. We have somebody bound. This is how we, we react to it. because. Otherwise, if it's stuck in a closet somewhere, nobody's going to know about it. So they need to practice, um, and they need to, people need to know CPR, which was also an issue that nobody in, their, in the schools knew CPR. So this was what the American Heart <coughs> Association said. OK, you need to have a plan. You need to know CPR. And then 
in schools who have patients who are at high risk, so that's if you know you have a patient at high risk, then an AED program makes sense. Um, so, and how do you decide if you need an AED in your school? Well, so the AED in the school was decided if there was a reasonable probability that they were gonna use it once in five years. It doesn't even have to be for a student. And the majority of AEDs in schools aren't used for students, honestly. They're used for the coaches. They're used for the parents who are coming to the games. They're used for the teachers. They're used for the principal. Okay, so the majority of the time, it's not the kids who need the AED. It's usually an adult who's in the situation. So a lot of schools can get away with saying, yeah, you know, we have teachers who have coronary artery disease, or there's a chance that that's going to happen, so we can use it. Um, and, or if they found that there's a patient who has, if they have had an episode in sudden cardiac death in the last five years, that's another reason people who are supposed to be at high risk, or if getting an EMS doctor in there is gonna take you more than five minutes, then yeah, it makes sense for you to have an AED in your school. Um, and so that's actually got people interested in this, and probably the majority of work that's been done in this in schools has been in the Wisconsin area. Um, Stu Berger is a friend of ours who really has been an advocate for this and really trying to make sure that we don't just shove AEDs in schools, but that we do this thoughtfully and we think about how we're making this work. And so the goal really is to educate, as, as Dr. Wong has talked about today, educating people about sudden cardiac death, <coughs> teaching CPR. CPR is big, okay, especially in schools. We, having an AED is great and we want it and we wanna use it, but people need to know how to do CPR as well, why you're getting the AED there. Um, and right now, and he wanted to get uh, AEDs in all high schools, and he presently has over 800 Wisconsin schools that have these AEDs in place. They're now kind of going out to Florida, Boston, Philadelphia, Atlanta. There are many different communities that are starting to take this intent and to say, yes, we need AEDs in our schools. And so this has really become an advocacy program throughout the country. So the controversies. So the, the issues with AEDs is that the cost per life saved is about 1.5 to 3.3 million dollars with AEDs in children, not in adults, in children. Um, the AED needs to be near wherever you think you're gonna use it. So as I said, if it's locked in a janitor's closet, it's not gonna be any help. And unfortunately, in a lot of places where people have met really well and bought AEDs for the schools, the school does not have the budget to keep the AED up, has not have the expertise to use it, doesn't have a program in place, and the AED gets shoved in a closet and nobody ever uses it, and that's a waste, and that's a crime. So if in the community people are thinking about an AED, it's a great gift, it's an important thing, but we have to think about how we're gonna do it and we have to have these programs in place before we just hand somebody an AED. Um, there are safety of AED in children. This has really probably been figured out. There was a lot of discussion about are AEDs safe in children? Should we be using them in children? They're safe in children. We can use them. And finally, where we're going to spend our money. Should we be spending money on AEDs in schools or should we be spending our money on AEDs in fitness clubs, in health clubs? Quite honestly, you're going to get a whole lot more bang for your buck in a fitness club with an AED than you are in a school. And so these are all the things that have kind of swirled around AED use in schools Kind of the take home message is an AED in a school is a fine thing, it'll work, but you can't just hand a school an AED and say there, go for it. Okay, that's not fair to do to anybody because they, don't, they need the money for the upkeep, they need training, they need to make sure they have a system in place that's really going to work as health clubs do, as casinos do, as airports do. They all have training programs, they all have upkeep, they all have everything in place. Schools need to have that as well. So. Finally, um, many of the technologies that we use in adults with heart disease can be modified for use in children. Um, the issues are we have a lot of extra challenges using these technologies in small children. And unfortunately, this is my soapbox, <coughs> the companies don't make these devices. There's no device that's actually approved in children. No implantable cardioverter defibrillator, no pacemaker, no catheters that are actually approved in children. I know that sounds absolutely insane. I use all these things that have never been approved for me to be using in children. And the reason is because we never do any trials in children. We never produce these things looking specifically at kids. We do what we have to do as pediatric VP docs is we have to take things that have gone through all these wonderful adult trials with thousands of adult patients and say, all right, we think we can use this. We can maybe use this a little bit differently than we've used it in the past. Um, or than the adults do. Maybe if we do this and we modify it this way, 
we can make it work in a kid. Um, and that's how we, we, we save lives. Um, the issue is there's nobody that is pushing the device companies to do these trials in children or to develop a device that's useful in children. It's not any money for them, unfortunately. They're very, as I said, there are few, if we looked at how many sudden deaths there were in kids, athletes, high school athletes in a year, it's only about 100, 110. So there really isn't the money there for them to do it, as opposed to the thousands upon thousands of adults, unfortunately, who will die daily from, from sudden cardiac death. So the only way to change this is through Congress. Um, the FDA would love to help us out. They'd love to have these regulations in place that said, you have to do a pediatric trial. They, they can't. Their hands are tied. They kind of are the slaves of Congress. So the only way to change this and to advocate for the kids is to actually go to Congress and say, we really need to say, yes, we're going to do trials in children. Yes, we want to have devices that are made for children. Yes, we need to do it this way. <coughs> Otherwise, all these problems that I've shown can't be solved because unfortunately we have to use the technology that we have available to us, which is the adult technology. And while we can use it and we can save lives, we can probably do things better. And that's really where we need to go from here. So I talk fast, sorry. <laughs> are, all, are defibrillators useful in all heart attacks? So I'll make a, a first um, a introductory or general comment about what is a heart attack and what is sudden, sudden cardiac arrest? So a heart attack, um, you know, really that occurs very commonly, um, um, about a million or so a year, uh, that um, uh, these are generally due to blockages in the blood supply to the arteries to the heart. So there are arteries that supply every part of the body, including the heart itself. And when there becomes a blockage, that uh, stoppage of blood flow causes uh, damage, uh, cell death within the heart, and that is definitely a heart attack. In a variety of circumstances, one of which is a heart attack, one can develop a life-threatening rhythm problem we call ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Those rhythm problems are extremely effectively stopped, converted uh, back to normal by a, a defibrillator. somebody in a relatively a place where there's not a lot of people around, and he drops and um, you know I'm not sure what the reason is I see this little AED up on the wall I could I could give him CPR I could use the AED or try to figure out how to use it um, what you know what's the proper uh, approach oh, sure. so absolutely so the first thing is to if you don't feel a, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, I have to repeat the question. So if, if you were walking with somebody in a relatively isolated place, but you happen to have the miracle of having an AED sitting right next to you, uh, what do you do? And so I think the first thing is you see if you can feel a pulse, if you can, and see if the patient is breathing. If they're not breathing and your friend is not breathing and not feel a pulse, absolutely start CPR, grab that AED, don't be afraid of it. It's going to tell you exactly what to do. You open it up, it's going to talk to you. It's going to tell you, okay, take this, put it here, okay. And then if the person isn't in a bad heart rhythm, it won't give them a shock. It, it's smart. It knows if somebody's in a bad heart rhythm or not. And it will say, okay, nope, not going to shock this. This isn't something I should shock. Okay? Well, if you if it's close, no, you can't. So if it's close enough, grab the AED and start. If you have two people, you're walking with two people, then you're even better. So then one of you can start CPR while the other person grabs it. Okay, great. I'll be happy to answer, uh, answer and re first repeat the question. And it is for atrial fibrillation, um, is it less predictable and reliable to do defibrillation? And so, uh, ablation. oh, or ab ablation? ablation? Oh, ablation. Okay, very good. So uh, first I'll talk about atrial fibrillation. So we mainly talked in our uh, talks about ventricular arrhythm arrhythmias, heart rhythm problems for the main pumping chambers. So we know the blood starts uh, in the upper chamber, then flows to the lower chamber. So when there is extremely rapid 
rhythm in the upper chambers that's very disorganized. I use the description that it's like a windstorm or a sandstorm blowing around very rapidly, many hundreds of beats per minute. That's what's happening in electrical signals in the upper chambers. So that can be a, quite a challenging situation. Luckily, that is not an immediately life-threatening condition like ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, but nonetheless, can, it can lead to a variety of symptoms. Shortness of breath, chest discomfort, fatigue, a variety of different uh, symptoms. And so it is definitely more challenging because there is not one small little islands of cells that are responsible specifically for that rhythm. It's much more generalized through the entire upper chamber. And so therefore, naturally, many solutions, such as um, directing energy, is a more complex solution as well. But luckily, I'm happy to report, the advances are occurring very rapidly. So for example, um, the cryoablation um, technology that <coughs> has been you know, now used for close to a decade in arrhythmias was just released um, in January uh, for atrial fibrillation. So we're seeing a lot of progress in this area. And undoubtedly, as we learn more about the real origin, we'll have even greater breakthroughs. But yes, it, it's an area of ongoing work, but luckily we can help patients today. Good question. Um, interestingly, back in the 70s, I think it was, right? So back in the 1970s, people, especially in the, the nuclear, when uh, people were all excited about nuclear power and nuclear age and all that, there were nuclear batteries that were working. And so there are nuclear pacemakers that some people still have in place. They don't stop working. The problem is with those is that. In some ways, it's a good thing that you have to change your battery because technology is changing so rapidly in these fields that what we found were that these batteries lasted forever, but the leads didn't last, or that they ha were stuck back only able to pace up to a certain rate and only recognize certain issues. That with pacemakers now, it's kind of like comparing a, uh, think of a bad car from the 1970s. I don't know. There you go, to a uh, Porsche today, OK? So things have really changed quite a bit. And so while I agree with you, we want these batteries to last longer. And, and they are starting, there is some technology that's working towards trying to get them to, to last longer, but to give them more bells and whistles so they do more fancy things, <coughs> um, trying to balance those two things. Um, we're still not there. We're still not at the point where we ha can say, OK, you've got 20 years on your battery. Um, my experience is that the bells and whistles are, uh, are such that the batteries last longer, less long. Absolutely. It used to because there's so many bells and whistles. Absolutely. It, it takes more juice. Absolutely. And this is something that we... Uh, and this is one of the biggest complaints that we have from the pa to the pacemaker companies right now is that, unfortunately, there are a lot of bells and whistles. And a lot of times those bells and whistles, yeah, sometimes they're important for some patients, especially, they're, as I said, they're kind of geared toward adult patients. Um, but in kids, they really, we never use any of them. So we tend to turn them all off. And that helps us with get our, get our battery life a little bit longer. But just like any technology, if you're using Microsoft Word on a computer, uh, <laughs> now it takes up gigabytes of the space right. on, your di on your disk, and the additional functionality that you get to use out of it is probably pretty minimal compared to six generations ago, and that's where we are with any of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, as Dr. Dubin says, we can turn them off. We can choose not <laughs> to use them. Okay, so um, the cost of AED. So first of all, you can purchase them at a variety of stores. You can certainly purchase them on the internet. Um, so Walmart. they are available. Uh, and so mm -hmm. they are available for typically under $1,000. There are clearly more expensive models, like everything you can buy. There is always an expensive model if you'd like to buy that, but mm -hmm. they're definitely available for under $1,000. Mm -hmm. Comment on the 
Costco doesn't sell them for six in a package. Or yeah. <laughs> but Costco does sell them. Costco does sell them. Does sell AEDs. Yes. Now, one of the things we would love to see is a $50 one or one that yeah. can be installed any place. <clears throat> Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a, a problem that spans both uh, Paul and my practice. I mean, you, it can develop very early in life. It can go, develop, you know, you can see it the first stages in the 70s, 80s. And interestingly, there has been an awful lot of research that has been coming out within the last 10, not even 10, five years, I would say, um, that is specifically looking at the genetics of this disease. This disease is like all over the board. So there are some people who can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and never know that they have it their whole lives. There are some people who they can present in infancy with a heart that doesn't work very well and rhythm problems. So it, it can be all, and there are some family members who can have sudden death and other family members who have the same genes but aren't affected at all. And so we're just starting to learn now about specifically which genes cause the worst kind of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We are learning about which genes can cause the higher risk of people dr dropping dead, um, which can cause more problems with heart failure. All, these inf all this information is really just now coming to light. So you can definitely say it's an inherited problem versus an acquired problem. This is an inherited problem, absolutely. It runs in families. An AED, the question is what will happen if an AED gives the heart a shock without the heart needing it? An AED won't do that. An AED is smart enough that it can recognize whether or not there is a shockable rhythm or not. But what about the thing that you put in the chest? Okay, an implantable defibrillator. So what happens if an implantable <laughs> defibrillator gives a heart a shock? Well, um, first of all, it feels lousy. Um, it, the issue, with, most people will tell you it feels like getting kicked in the chest by a mule um, or a horse. And, uh, you will have some patients who will actually get traumatized by it and have post-traumatic stress disorder secondary to it. Um, it. In the best of circumstances, it feels horrible and you don't feel very well and it's not a very pleasant experience. In the worst of circumstances, it can put your heart into a bad heart rhythm as well if it hits you at the wrong time. So it can be dangerous. I think I just want to add, but in, I think an important, important part of that is that the AEDs that are for lay people to use mm -hmm are built so well today, and this is different than the first generations, but they are built so well today that you don't have to be scared to use them because you think that it will give somebody a shock who doesn't need it. So that's the important take home message, that if you witness somebody having an arrest and you're, you, you see an AED, not only will this device walk you through how to use it, but it won't let you use it, on, it won't deliver a shock unless the patient has a particular rhythm which is a shockable rhythm. Because there are patients who have a cardiac arrest who will not benefit from a shock. And in that case, the device will not give a shock. So you do not have to be reticent to use it because you're afraid you're going to do harm. Are the differences between men and women with these kinds of problems? Uh, so the question is, are there differences between in men and women? Yes, we constantly are learning more and more about differences in, in men and women. Um, the onset of coronary artery disease, as you know, is quite different, delayed uh, approximately a decade uh, in women. Uh, so we see a very different manifestation very frequently of many of these kinds of risks and disorders. So we're constantly learning. One study will show, gee, the patients benefit more if they're men or women for one kind of condition and treatment. So it's an ongoing discovery process that occurs. So definitely an area of great interest. Um, and certainly what we really want to achieve in a lot of the major um, areas of investigation are large clinical trials. So we really want to have a good representation of men and women as well as ethnic diversity as we look at those trials so that we can generalize and have good data that apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. What do you know about why? 
Oh, I, I think we're diagnosing it more because we know to look for it. I'm sorry, so the question was, uh, we think that the, the rate of diagnosis is of AVNRT in children is going up. And I don't think it's really a change in how many kids have it, obviously. I think it's, what, if you have it, you have it. But I think people are recognizing it as a problem more in children, and we have ways of looking for it more in children than we used to have. And we have ways of now of curing it in children that we didn't used to have. Is it something, is that kind of screening something that's become or recommended to become part of a standard pediatric exam? And the question is, what, is this a recommended for a standard pediatric exam? I'd say no. I think most children who have SVT, um, they're going to let you know. <laughs> they're going to tell you, I don't feel well, my heart's going too fast, it's beeping, it's butterflying, whatever their term of the week is. slide that you had of the 13-year-old that got the baseball in the center of the chest. And uh, many years ago, uh, teaching for the American Heart Association, we used to teach a precordial thumb. And then we stopped doing that thumb. Is that what occurred to this young man? Mm -hmm. Great question. So the question is, um, uh, re referring to the 13-year-old uh, uh, who was playing baseball and received a, a thud uh, to his chest for a baseball, uh, is that similar, or that brings to mind the teaching by American Heart Association many years ago of a thump to the chest, we call it a precordial thump. What's the relationship there? So it's really precisely felt to be the same relationship. So we think that the energy delivery, the mechanical transfer, gets converted through a chemical reaction into an electrical impulse, and that, that electrical impulse acts in a very precisely timed point in the heart's cycling, and that that precision results in this life-threatening arrhythm problem. So it's that conversion of mechanical to chemical to electrical energy that we think is exactly occurring. Thank you. If you were going to do studies on children, where would you get the children? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, the question is, where would you get the children to study? And I think this is one of those things that we always worry about, but we... When we perform studies in general, we want to perform studies, and when people think about studies, they think about these quote unquote randomized clinical trials. Everybody hears that term everywhere, and what that means is that half your patients will get, the, the get, a, get a, a certain um, treatment, the other half will not get that treatment, will get a different treatment, or will get no treatment, and it depends on what the problem is, whether they get the normal treatment or whether they get the new treatment. And in order to do these, and there have been a lot of ethics meetings talking about this specifically, and specifically talking about it in children, you need to be at a point of equipoise. And what equipoise means is that you're at a point where you don't know what's better. You don't know if your new therapy is gonna do wonderful things or if your older therapy is better. And if you're really at that point, Ethically, there really is no reason not to do the trial then and not to, to actually recommend this to your patients to be a part of it because you may actually be helping them more with this new therapy than you are with the old therapy. Um, and I think that the majority of our clinical trials are at that point. Uh, we don't have enough research and we know where our issues are. If we can get us into a situation with a device or with a medication or with whatever we're looking at in our clinical trials, that we say, okay, you know what? If we know that something's better than the other, we shouldn't be doing the trial at all. You're right. But if we don't know and we think that there's a more of a benefit from it, but we're not sure, then we really owe it to our patients to do these trials. And there are lots of patients who are interested in doing it. One of the unique issues in kids, though, um, was highlighted by a, a trial that was done about six years ago by one of my, my really good friends, Bob Shaddy. Yeah. So you probably have heard of the drug called a beta blocker. So one of the standard treatments now for, for adults with heart failure is a medicine called a beta blocker. And in fact, there is data that the American Heart Association says that if you have heart failure and you're not on a beta blocker, you're not being treated appropriately. When they do those trials in adults, most of the large trials have a minimum of about 1,500 patients, and some of those trials have as many as three or 4,000 patients, and they complete them in a year and a half because there are a lot of patients with heart failure uh, in, in uh, over age 50. We, Dr. Shaddy and a, a lot of uh, heart failure doctors around the country and kids tried to do such a trial, 
Uh, it took us almost seven years. We enrolled 190 patients. And because the numbers weren't high enough, statistically, we really didn't have a trial that had the power, the number of patients, to really be able to answer the question. So at the end of the day, the trials, the results of the trial said that beta blockers don't work in kids. But nobody believes it. And so we haven't, a lot of us haven't changed our practice dramatically because the trial was so underpowered. There weren't enough patients in it. There are just, in some circumstances, just not enough children, or it would take us 10 or 20 years to do the trial in kids. So what we rely on as pediatric cardiologists is people like Paul saying, this works. And then what we at least want to show in kids is that it doesn't do any harm. We want to show that a beta blocker given to a child doesn't have an, an adverse reaction that would be not suspected based on their age, the differences because of their developmental metabolism and other issues. That's not perfect, and we would love to, to test each of these things in kids, um, but sometimes we just can't. Because even within a pediatric trial, there's a big difference between a two-year-old and a 12-year-old. So do you have to do a study of kids under five and then a separate study of preteens and then a separate study of teenagers? That would make it even more difficult. So we are at, at a some degree of a disadvantage. Um, and as Dr. Dubin said, and then the other piece is that almost all the drugs that we use as a pediatric cardiologist, almost all the devices we use aren't approved by the FDA for use in kids. So technically we are violating the FDA's guidelines in every patient we treat because all the medicines and all the drugs and um, uh, all the techniques, every catheter we use, every device we use is not approved for use in children, but we save lots of lives in doing that. That's a unique challenge for kids. There are similar challenges in adults. You've heard of the clot-busting drug TPA. The patient has a stroke or a heart attack, they get this miracle drug, it it, it basically busts the clot that causes the heart attack. The initial clinical trials that had a few thousand adults show that it didn't work. And of course, I'm sure Genentech's stock went down by a tremendous amount when that came out. And it wasn't that the drug didn't work. It was that the, the studies were underpowered, and they, they turned out they needed eight to 10,000 patients in that kind of a trial in order to get those kinds of answers. And they went back and they did and those drugs have some benefit today. That's a unique challenge in doing clinical research. That, that's a great question. The question is, should we use echocardiograms as screening tools to look for abnormalities in the heart muscle, et cetera? Um, and that's one of the biggest controversies out there right now, uh, especially in athletes, is do, how do we screen them, who screens them, and what tests do we do to look at it? Uh, the issue is pretty complex and pretty challenging for several reasons. Number one, could we save lives? Probably, we could. Um, number two is, who are we gonna get to do these tests because we don't have the manpower right now to be able to do this across the country. We don't have the financial resources across the country to do this either. Echocardiograms are expensive as, and so they can, can and finally, they can be misinterpreted. And so who's going to read them and who's going to have the expertise to read them? Do we have enough physicians in the country who are able to do this uh, and do this well. Uh, so the answer isn't in yet. It, it's a great thought, and lots of people are thinking this, um, but the, it's a pretty multifaceted question, and in our healthcare situation right now in this country, um, it is a big, big problem. standard regulation uh, therapy is a drug which has unpleasant side effects. I wonder if there is any chance that we can see some improvement or change in this test. Great. I'd be happy to discuss that. So the question is, uh, uh, some arrhythmias are associated with increased risk of stroke and that most commonly a certain medication is used. And is there any hope that we'll have 
you know, freedom from that approach and its complications. So the condition is the same one we described, that is atrial fibrillation, uh, upper rhythm problem. And indeed, there is an increased risk of stroke. Uh, we're learning more and more about how to predict which patients should be treated with which medication. And so that's one area we need a lot more work on. Uh, some of it's going to be genetic. Some of it will be other studies and other characteristics. So part of medicine and doing it wisely is having information about how to treat each kind of patient differently or specially. Um, and the good answer also is that in this year alone, in the last year and in the next two or three years, there's going to be new drugs or have been new drugs introduced which are free of a lot of the issues of other forms of what we call anticoagulation, issues that prevent clotting and therefore reduce the risk of stroke. And so um, the latest medication, for example, was shown in a large clinical trial to um, be uh, therapeutic that is effective in more patients more of the time. And so therefore, in a miraculous way in some sense, result in lower strokes, but actually also lower bleeding in the brain as well. And you would think it would be always a trade-off, but because they act much more in the correct range rather than going up and down in terms of the therapeutic range, they probably can achieve the best benefit. Um, in addition, there are uh, studies and new therapies designed to close uh, certain parts of the upper chambers that are most likely to develop clots. And so they're mechanical solutions to try to prevent clots. So we have a lot to look forward to, and a lot of work is being done here at Stanford. That's a, a very good question. So the question is, how, are, how do we view SIDS, or sudden infant death syndrome, in relationship to sudden cardiac death? Um, the, what we've been finding lately, the more we have been learning about sudden cardiac death, we're finding that a very large proportion of these SIDS deaths are the problem called long QT syndrome, which Dr. Wong talked a little bit about. And that is a genetic problem, runs in families, where you will have a sudden death episode, and it can be triggered from lots of reasons, concur as early as one, you know, unfortunately one, two, three months of age, all the way up through adulthood. Um, and so there have been several studies that have looked, have done pathology studies looking at autopsies of babies who have died of SIDS and have found that indeed they did have this, a great percentage of them did have this genetic abnormality. And while it's a horrible, a horrible situation to have a baby who dying of SIDS, what's probably the best thing that can come out of this now is that we can therefore recognize this syndrome within a family. Because while it's, it's terrible that this baby died, we have to also worry about everybody who's left behind. And these people also, we need to figure out who are these family members are who are at risk. And so we are now able to do that with our genetic testing that's available to us. Um, we can kind of figure out in these tragic deaths, especially early tragic deaths, do we need to worry about the rest of the family as well? Sure, that's, that's a great question. And actually, it's an advertisement to come to uh, Dr. McConnell's and Dr. Feinstein's talk, because you're going to have a whole two hours on, on those images. Um, echoes are still the mainstay of imaging. And I would say for most of what we need to do in, in our field, and I, I think in Paul's uh, uh, patient population as well, they probably take care of about 90% of, of the diagnosis we need to make. But it's those extra 10% where things get complicated, where we're using techniques of CT and MRI. And um, we do about, I think, about 600 um, MRI and CT scans on kids' hearts every year at, at Packer Children's. So we do quite a large number of those as part of our diagnostic armamentarium, and we're using them much more frequently. I would say 10 years ago, we probably did 50 or 60. Um, 
And there's a trade-off. Uh, CT scans do require a fair amount of radiation, whereas an echocardiogram has no radiation at all. MRI does not involve radiation, but if you've ever been in an MRI scanner, you have to, first of all, if, you're, if you have any degree of fear of closed in spaces, it's a problem, but also you have to lay still for 45, 50 minutes to get a heart MRI done. So for little kids, that's impractical. Um, and they then require anesthesia, so then you have the risk of anesthetics. So we do all those tests. Uh, none of them have replaced cardiac ultrasound yet as the primary diagnostic screening tool, um, and ultrasounds have gotten better. If you look at a heart ultrasound from 20 years ago and then 10 years ago and look at what we have today, it's amazing what they've done in terms of image capture and the ability to see things. And again, when, when Jeff and Mike uh, uh, talk about some of the imaging things, you'll see much, much better pictures than what I was able to show you. Very good. Well, thank you, uh, Anne and Paul, uh, for an illuminating talk. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, time up. Um, I just um, want to remind you that next week, uh, I think we're going to shift back into a more high-tech um, uh, area. Bobby Robbins is going to be talking about new devices and new approaches on the surgical end for correction of heart defects. Um, and then uh, Alan Young, uh, who is one of Paul's colleagues who runs our adult cardiology program and interventional program, is going to talk about all the things that one can do to fix the heart that don't require surgery, putting in valves with a catheter, closing holes, and, and the like. Um, so I hope to see you all next, uh, next uh, Tuesday night. And um, again, thanks to our uh, two uh, lecturers tonight, and have a good night. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.